Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 23 of Creative Writers and Illustrators. And my guest for the day is Nalini Ramachandran, author of this latest book, Gods, Giants, and the Geography of India. So, Nalini, quickly welcome. Yeah, thank you, Shamla. Thank you so much for this. Yeah. Uh, so, can you quickly tell our readers what this book is all about? Sure. Uh, so, Gods, Giants, and the Geography of India. Um, as simply as the title uh, says, it is about gods, giants and the geography of India. So it's basically about uh, the country's geography, the landscape, geological formations, the stories uh, behind, ge you know, geographical processes. And it's just folklore legends that have been told over time. But uh, what's interesting is that I tried to draw parallels uh, between the stories and the processes and how the formations, uh, you know, came to exist. So this concept is called geomythology. And that's what the book is about. You know, I always look forward to reading your books because I always feel that uh, when you look at life, I mean, it's like you step out the door and you're always looking for stories. You know, your last book was on that. Yeah puppets and you explored a different area and you found stories everywhere yeah right? and i yeah. see that you've done the same in this book and it's something like geography so what is your relationship with geography in school uh, to me it looks like it was good otherwise you wouldn't have explored this book <laughs> <laughs> honestly i think um, i did quite enjoy learning the subject but uh, beyond the point, uh, I think it just revolved around maps. And I love drawing. So I love creating maps. And uh, I think all of us have done all kinds of maps in school, you know, agricultural maps. And then you have these plotting of rivers and mountains and stuff. So you use different color pencils, brown for mountains with a triangle. And rivers would be this, uh, you know, uh, squiggly line in blue and stuff. So it's, it's very limited in that sense, because I think there is only so much that schools used to teach us. And uh, while researching for the book, I realized that um, we have to move beyond what the textbooks tell us and maybe explore another dimension altogether. Uh, there are so many bountiful rivers, lakes, and so many other water bodies in India. So what was it that you're looking for when it came to collect these stories. There are 27 stories in the book. Right. Okay. Yeah, right. So I had an exhaustive list, to be honest. I think all possible rivers, mountains, everything made it to that list. But there were two things I had to keep in mind. You know, one was about uh, how substantial mm -hmm. or interesting the story itself uh, was because... Um, a lot many times what happens is there are repetitive stories. Mm -hmm. So it's possible that two mountains uh, have similar stories, but they might not have any relation whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So I had to, you know, think which one fits into the book uh, better. The other thing I had to uh, keep in mind was about showing the diversity in terms of the landscape. So I, I, I could have done, you know, the top five rivers or something like that but it wouldn't have made sense because then i wouldn't have had the chance to speak about you know riverine potholes or you know uh, the pumdis uh, of manipur or something like that so it it was about you know giving equal weightage uh, to both myths and uh, the geography uh, part of uh, the country what was your biggest challenge in uh, you know researching for this book because i've seen you you've done total justice you know you picked up uh, uh, formations from all over India, you know, and you right. ensure that you, you actually take the trouble of uh, finding out the smallest detail. And you know, there, there's a lot, yeah. it's like almost maddening. I was like, oh my God, this must be a huge <laughs> process. It, it was, it was. And I'm, I'm really glad that you observed that because uh, it was madness. The whole research process was madness because like I said, once we had the list and then I had to sit and sift through it and figure out, you know, which stories and which places would go into the book. And um, I think, yeah, choosing places was the biggest challenge because 
there were times when I thought maybe I had, you know, one particular story, for example, from uh, Meghalaya. And I'm very upset that it didn't make it to the book. But uh, when I looked at it from the lens of geomythology, I realized that the geography part wasn't uh, working out that well. So, you know, it was very uh, heartbreaking in some instances to leave out certain stories because the story would have been very interesting but you know the other part wasn't working out well so that was important and I think uh, drawing connections that was uh, it was a challenge because you you don't find all the information easily you know so um, sometimes you have to interpret it you will have to put information that you find from different sources together and make it your own so those things were challenging because uh, also it shouldn't be incorrect in terms of, you know, the scientific processes. So I had to kind of go back and relearn uh, aspects of geography and put it in as simple, whatever, a language that I could. I think what you've done is very beautiful because, you know, when it comes to mythology, it is like suspension of disbelief. Right. right. On the other hand, then, you know, you try to integrate science with mythology and you yeah. it, you talk about the plates and the shifting of the plates and then it, it's a total new landmass altogether. And I think it's, it's done very beautifully the way you, uh, uh, you know, blended both and made sense of it and presentable mm-hmm. to a gen, uh, to the right. current generation, I think, which is very important. Now, you also talk about, uh, you've not like... Uh, focused on it you like you know in passing mentioned that how the Yaman, Yamuna has got polluted you know hmm. and uh, uh, the Kandahar Kandahar right Kandahar, uh, so the, yeah. Yeah, the, the uh, water out there has got red and due to mining hmm. right so uh, when you look when you did research for all these uh, water bodies uh, do you find that there is hope for the next generation that these uh, you know they, they should not just remain restricted to uh, books you know that they will exist right. and they will exist in a form which is pristine and enjoyable to the next generation right uh okay so again two parts to this answer i think there are people who are working on these causes yeah. uh my way of working on it is by writing about it because i think each person is wired in a different way you know each person approaches a problem in a different way i may not be there out on the field but i feel okay writing about it is equally important because that's going to help so many more people know especially the younger uh, you know generation so there are people who are working on it uh, there are tribals uh, various communities who live in those regions who are you know, voicing uh, their rights, you know, their needs, everything. So I think uh, somewhere acknowledging that was also important through the book. And uh, the other part of it is that um, by writing this book, I hope to create hope. So I'm hoping that the people who read it might be, you know, uh, active in a very different way and take up these causes or even small things, you know, if it comes to even responsible tourism, they needn't really go there and hold banners and, you know, uh, protest if they are not, you know, uh, wired that way. But uh, if uh, they are travelers and they go to these places, it's just about, you know, basic responsible tourism. Don't litter, you know, don't throw garbage, sustainable tourism. It's, It's just about that. So I'm hoping that each person who reads it will take back something uh, that they can personalize, internalize in, you know, yeah, in that sense. So, uh, you know, this is the first time I've heard about the Dharwad crater, you know, and the Vanara connection uh, uh, right. with Hampi, which is uh, mostly known for the architecture wonder of uh, uh, the Vijayanagara yeah. Empire. Yeah. So what was your biggest discovery when, you know, or uh, let's just say, uh, what myths were shattered? What notions of yours were shattered when you were researching for the book and writing this? Uh, I think especially in the case of Hampi, uh, it never occurred to me that, you know, uh, Krishna Devaraya or the Vijayanagara Empire would have uh, built architecture around the landscape, you know. So as far as that particular story is concerned, I was quite amazed that, oh, there was, you know, someone so thoughtful 
and they could have simply thought okay you know these are boulders let's get rid of them you know what difference would it make in any case it might just make the landscape look cleaner or something but that's not true you know they built uh, and it's it's just so beautiful in terms of the contrast because you have these you know unorganized heaps of uh, huge large stones and then there is this built structure which is very ornate right in you know the midst of all of this so it's very interesting that uh, so many hundred years ago there were people who thought uh, so much about the landscape and how to utilize it and how to build their homes uh, to fit into that uh, region so of these 27 water bodies how many have you visited okay no all are not water bodies but yeah, I mean, uh, some of the so land forms you know you mentioned the right right so i i have visited a few uh, unfortunately i think the book was also written in you know during the pandemic year so that was another reason but again you know i think the book is uh, more about the geo myths so in that sense the research had to be very different so you know it it was more about you know reading making connections than actually visiting the place and figuring out whether it's true or not because yeah you know so it it, it was just a very different kind of uh, book to work on yeah so most of these stories are centered not most i think some of them are centered around uh, vishnu uh, rama krishna you know so basically avatars of of vishnu right right, right. So, uh, whether uh, uh, you know there are not many gods uh, the mini gods or the local deities were, were they not uh, i mean the stories were not appealing enough or was it like wherever you went you picked these stories with consciousness no. because uh, the readers will be able to relate to the characters no 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 it wasn't like that at all like i said you know i had to give equal importance to the land forms as well so if and uh like i said it wouldn't have made sense picking the story of you know maybe a, a demigod or a lesser known god if the geographical part wasn't powerful enough you know so i think it's just that uh, they happen to be more about vishnu and his avatars i'm guessing it's also because of his role as a preserver so uh, that makes a lot of uh, difference but there are other goddesses you know lesser known goddesses uh, again even with vishnu there are lesser known avatars of vishnu yes. so yes there is krishna there is rama but there is also daityasudan for example so you know uh, i think that was also important because okay we do know them as these three uh, you know um, arch deities or whatever but beyond that what's happening so yeah in terms of you know the world of mythology and a lot of these are folk folk myths so yeah so have you found your next project while you were researching for this story <laughs> because it would be uh, tiny 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 stories <laughs> everywhere and you're like ah I yeah there are a lot i know you know sometimes i i feel i i put a lot of stories in one book itself and i know that there will be other smart writers who might just make each one a different book but uh yeah i i don't tend to do that i don't know why but uh, yeah no so there are a few but in the ideation and research stage so there's really not much that you know i can talk about now because i i'll really have to see where they go yeah so you know tell us something about the research you know once you hmm. decided on the first of all why did you even choose a topic like this because i had never heard of geo mythology unless and until i found the book and you know and exactly. i'm happy i made that this was a wonderful book uh, uh, to get introduced to the subject so how did you discover geo mythology you know to make those connections it's not something hmm. just comes out of nowhere right yeah so i think initially the thought was just to um, write a book on geography very random thought okay again there was no uh, i mean there was no trigger as such or no particular reason or motivation but it was just a random thought that uh, okay maybe i should write a book on geography and then of course you know what about geography because there is enough that they study in textbooks and i really didn't want to go on you know go down the same route 
uh, what do I know best? I think it's storytelling. So then I thought maybe if there were stories related to geography, kids would be more interested in learning the subject because what happens is in schools, um, they learn the theory part of it. Yes. And when they're traveling, they get to know the, you know, geo heritage part of it. So it's very, um, not too many uh, children maybe make the connection or maybe not too many parents really uh, have, uh, you know, it, it depends, you know, because I don't know how many people, are, I don't know too many people who are interested in geography as such. So as a subject, so I, you know, you also see how many people pursue geography eventually once they grow up, right? So I think those were the questions and a lot of times, you know, even we ourselves as children and I have nephews, nieces, they would always wonder why are we learning geography? Okay, science and mathematics, at least there is some value for what about geography? So, you know, these were the questions and I thought stories would be interesting. It just began as geography legends. At that time, I didn't know that there was a proper concept uh, called geomythology. But uh, once I started researching, I realized that, again, with geography, there are different uh, ways of looking at it, different ways of studying uh, geography. One of those is cultural geography. So when it comes to cultural geography, it basically talks about how people relate to the landscape around them. And the moment you have people and landscape, it's always, you know, cultural bond in terms of belief systems. So those belief systems then, you know, uh, give rise to myths and legends. And uh, yeah, so that is how I started researching. And I thought, okay, there would be quite a lot. And I think we are so used to listening to stories uh, about, say, Ganga or Surya or some, you know, they're, they're very popular. So somewhere I wanted to move beyond that. And that's also... One of the reasons why I didn't take the whole Ganga uh, story network into the book, because otherwise there's a lot that happens just with that river in terms of geomythological terms. But uh, I thought, okay, we should look at other rivers as well. And let's see where that goes. Yeah. So you've broken this book into several sections. So can you tell us a bit about it, like, you know, uh, in hmm. royal dreams and then uh, uh, epic journeys and conflict and change. So, hmm. you know. So what was the purpose of creating these, uh, putting them into, uh, st putting the stories into these slots? Yeah, see, honestly, Shamala, it was very difficult to structure the book because uh, initially I thought maybe I should follow like a mythological timeline. Then I realized that the geography wasn't fitting in. Then I thought maybe I should follow a geological timeline. And I realized that things that were happening in mythology before were happening later in geological you know so it, it didn't make sense and i i would have to do a lot of explaining to the readers if i had to follow that kind of a timeline it made more sense to do a thematic book then and that's when it occurred that okay you know then i should stick to creation preservation and destruction because it's common to both geography and mythology and within that, I think I uh, broke down the chapters and I thought about, okay, let me think about this logically. So I begin with where the gods live. Then I move on to, okay, you know, human civilization and how humans had to share space with wildlife. Then, you know, it goes on to uh, the whole concept of protection, you know, uh, nature and protection. And who is the protector? Is it nature? Is it, you know, some god is it some giant or is it human being and then you know so slowly it just kind of goes in and i think with every aspect it ties up with uh, the concept of uh, ecological balance and climate change and that was very contemporary in terms of you know what's happening in the world today so somewhere i thought that was also important so even though that was not a uh, uh, you know, uh, decision right from the beginning. It just happened naturally. Yeah. Which is your favorite story? Oh, there are quite a few, but let me see. Hmm. Would you like yeah, to read out a small passage for two minutes from something? 
I would maybe I should read out the end then because uh, I, you know, put in verse at the end. Okay. Yes. Yes. Of, yes. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it's uh, it's called pause and play. Okay. Wait, 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 wait. That, first, first, tell tell what it's all about. Why? Why did you feel that uh, the pause and play had to be included in the book? You know, because right. the entire book so, is filled with stories, and then here you come. Uh, with verse right so what uh, happened was i think um, after i finished writing the last section i realized that it was still not tying up and even though the last section is about nataraja and uh, the whole cosmos it still felt uh, somewhat you know loose and incomplete and i thought okay you know there has to be something that ties this whole thing up and i wrote something um, Initially, it was a very bad attempt at free verse, which didn't work out. And then we thought, okay, let us follow meter and rhythm. And that's how this whole, you know, verse in some kind of rhyme happened at the end. And uh, yeah, I think maybe once I read it, eventually people will understand why pause and play is important, right? Yeah. Okay. Pause and play. The world that Brahma built and the land's sudden tilt. Vishnu's big victory and the stone arches history. Shiva's sparkling crown and the glaciers melting down. Matsya's search for refuge and the fury of a deluge. Jalodbhava's refusal to budge and the Karevas's layers of sludge. Parashurama's aim so fine and the appearance of a coastline. Vasuki's still gaze and the Sarpakavu's green ways, Krishna's naughty pranks and a river's wistful banks. Rook Mini of a riverine isle, Sindhu Sagar's quiet crawl and the sea levels rise and fall, Raktabahu's brilliant ploy and the sea water's silent decoy, Vishnu's peaceful sleep and the mountain's incredible steep. Nanda's merging with snow, and the hailstones deadly blow. The Pauri Bhuyan's life of toil, and the mining of their soil. A princess's love for her lake, and the floating Pumri's at stake. Cheraman's pursuit of new beliefs, and the rise of coral reefs. Raja Rituparna's big blunder, and the hidden limestone wonder, Vasudeva's changed boon, and a salt lake building fortune, Sahasrajana's harmful game, and how a river got its name, Humpy's tale of warring kith, and artfully weathered moon, Rama's arrow striking land, and a stream becoming sand, Nala's efforts broken down, and in a faraway ghost town, Lonasura's looming. Nalli, you're frozen. I lost your voice. I'm sorry, we lost internet connection and we are glad to have Nalini back. So Nalini, um, tell us about the geographical uh, geography theories you've discovered for this book. Anything particularly striking with respect to mythology and the Indian terrain? Uh, yes, I think everything is about the Indian terrain, you know. Yeah. So it was, it was very fascinating to discover... Uh, that there's so much happening in geography uh, in that sense, you know. But uh, I think one of the stories that I really uh, found, uh, I, it, it was just, you know, very delightful the way it uh, happened. So there is a story called uh, A Goddess's Work of Art and it talks about the Nigoj riverine potholes. And uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the mythology, the story talks about how a particular goddess and her sisters carved certain holes using their fingers and nails. 
uh, on the banks and uh, of modulate you know they could basically uh, control the flow of that river and uh, geographically it's uh, interesting because uh, that is done by very tiny pebbles that get into you know crevices and cracks in uh, the banks the rocks and they twirl and twirl and twirl and then eventually over you know several years it, it becomes a pothole so i think you know a lot of such discoveries were interesting because i realized for every geographical phenomena there were stories and it's not that you know even even the most bizarre things had a myth or a legend backing it up so that was very interesting uh, did you draw any parallels between uh, the indian mythology and the greek mythology that you've read uh, in the past no unfortunately i didn't really delve that deep into it because i think i wanted to focus on indian uh, geo mythology and that itself hasn't been explored too well so you know getting into other mythologies maybe sometime in the future but it would have been too much to do uh, with this and there was enough research going on for just this so it it would have been you know completely confusing even for me to do something like that but uh, there are parallels in in terms of the great flood myth for example you know mm -hmm. so we do know that um, uh, every other mythology that we've heard of does have a similar story so yeah and, and that's how you know i think somewhere that made it to the cover as well that's yes. much here so yeah. Yeah. I, i would like to tell the readers uh, uh, that sharanya kunnath has designed the cover yes and and yes. she's done a fab job just not on the cover but also the uh, inside illustrations yes inside illustrations are brilliant as well and it's it's uh, it you know it was very uh, it's difficult because one geography is colorful and this is primarily a black and white book and of course you know landscape landforms are 3d so here we you know you have to work with either black or white so we were really wondering how that would turn out but i think it's just uh, beautiful the way it has turned out it's just gorgeous and uh, we made geography the background of the stories because uh, we realized that just showing uh, yeah so you know these are that's one of my favorite artworks over there and uh, you know that's talking about a hot spring basically but uh, it's it's very interesting that we could do a lot of stuff with just black and white and is there a particular art form that she's she used or is part it of anally has she used a particular so, art form or yeah. is it stippling no so initially we had thought that maybe we should use uh, something similar to sanji which is you know the stencil cut work mm -hmm. of uh, uh, uttar pradesh but uh, eventually i think uh, sharanya just made it her own because there are a lot of such ornate work uh, yeah. you know artworks throughout so that would have been very again you know sticking to one particular art form so i think this it just allowed her more freedom to experiment as well so it's based on it but it's not exactly that so i think she's just you know done a great job with that yeah so i think we've come to the end of the session uh, so before we leave quickly tell kids what they'll be missing out or what they will be uh, discovering in your book and why they should read your book so if you've always wondered about you know how certain rivers were formed how why a mountain is taller than the other or uh, you know uh, what causes earthquakes and if you don't want answers that are already in your textbook i think this is the book you should go to and pick up and read because it's going to tell you a lot of interesting stuff and uh, yeah i think you should just you know open your keep your minds open keep telling stories yeah because uh, the places around you tell stories as well yeah so thanks for tan for joining us today nalini thank